Party's Justice and Home Affairs spokesperson at Westminster, she has proposed and championed the idea of a citizens' assembly for Scotland and has written about the subject uh, across the UK. Next to her, we have David Martin, who is the official convener designated the Scottish Citizens' Assembly, the former MEP, and I believe the UK's longest serving MEP as well. Then we have um, next to David Louise Coolgar, who is an actual Citizens' Assembly member of the Citizens' Assembly in Ireland, and since taking part, she's become a really keen advocate of deliberative processes as a way of increasing citizens' engagement. And then we have Professor David Farrell, Head of Politics and International Relations at University College Dublin, and he is a specialist in the study of representation in national parties, and is the research leader in the Irish Citizens' Assembly. Then we have Dr. Oliver Escobar, Senior Lecturer in Public Policy at the University of Edinburgh and co-director of the Scotland. Um, Oliver is an expert in participatory democracy, democratic innovation, community engagement and collaborative government. He coordinates the citizen participation network and, and is involved in developing democratic innovations across policy areas in Scotland and beyond. And then finally, Leslie Riddick, who you know is a journalist and broadcaster, has a speaker of Parliament, a channel four series run for five years in the 1990s by the Citizens' Assembly. So an absolute uh, fantastic panel for citizens' questions. Um, so I'm just going to invite each of our panelists to make a brief contribution um, to say just a few words before we move into questions. So we'll start with um, Joanna. Right, thanks very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here this evening and to share a panel, particularly with our two visitors from Ireland. We're really delighted that they were able to come. Professor David Farrell and I met at a conference earlier this year at the University of Oxford, which was on remaking the British Constitution. Um, and a lot of the conference focused on exercises in deliberative democracy that have taken place across the world, not just in Ireland, but particularly in Canada, also, and there was quite a bit of a discussion with a degree of scepticism about the possibility of using a citizens' assembly to break out of the current Brexit crisis that we're in. And you'll be aware that one of the recent Tory party leadership candidates, Rory Stewart, um, proposed that, and it's also been proposed by Stella Creasy, the Labour MP. But there, there was a degree of scepticism about that, but there was a general feeling that the, situate, the state that Scotland's in on its constitutional journey might be a good time at which to hold a citizens' assembly in Scotland. And uh, having had an interest, or a building interest in deliberative democracy, I and others put forward a resolution to my party's conference, the SNP conference, that a series of citizens' assemblies should be held across Scotland. Before that resolution was passed, the First Minister picked up the ball and ran with it and announced that there will, that there will be a citizens' assembly in uh, Scotland this autumn and David Martin sitting to my left is going to be one of the co-conveners and I'll leave it to him to talk a little bit about what the Assembly is uh, likely to do. Um, it will come as no surprise to anyone that as an SNP MP I believe Scotland should be an independent country so from that perspective uh, I see citizen engagement with issues that, the, that need to be tackled in Scotland and active discussion about them as a way that might move us forward towards independence but other people are coming to the Citizens' Assembly from a different perspective and will see it differently. And there are many issues that we could discuss usefully that will unite those of us who want independence and those of us uh, who don't. So different views about what the Assembly is for is what democracy is all about. But its remit will be focused by the conveners and the uh, Assembly uh, members. And I'll just say briefly, my experience of the Brexit process has been that the most effective point of view of someone who's a Remainer and would like to see the whole of the United Kingdom remain in the European Union, the most effective initiatives that have occurred from the Remain side during the Brexit process have been cross-party initiatives where people from different parties have worked together and also worked with civic society. Dave and I from different parties were co-petitioners in the case that went to the European Court of Justice and established that Article 50 could be unilaterally revoked. During the indicative vote process in Parliament, I and others put forward various motions. My motion was about replacing no deal with revocation as a default. That motion got off the ground and got decent support because it had cross-party support with buy-in from all parties apart from the Democratic Unionists. 
And again, the, part, the, uh, the movement for a second referendum across the UK has benefited from cross-party support and buy-in from civic society. And I'm, I'm very proud that I was instrumental in persuading my party, the SNP, to support a second EU referendum <coughs> and uh, the people's vote. So I think the Citizens' Assembly should be about what can be achieved when we put to one side our tribal political affiliations and we bring people into the, we bring people into the mix who aren't interested in those tribal affiliations and we approach difficult and controversial issues with, with people who aren't just politicians like me engaged. And I believe in it very, very passionately. And I'm absolutely delighted that David can be one of the co-conveners. And I hope that the contributions from specialists like Oliver and uh, people like Leslie, who've worked in this area for years, and our Irish visitors this evening will be illuminating about the positive aspect of what a Citizens' Assembly could deliver. So thank you. Well, thank you, Joanna. And let me just follow on from Joanna's last point there, that this assembly is going to try and change the tone of the debate in Scotland. It's about a respectful discussion about where Scotland should be in the future. Those looking for precise statements about how it's going to work tonight will be a bit disappointed because, frankly, we're still working through uh, some of that, and part of that process is learning from our Irish friends and how it worked in, in Ireland. But let me give you some outline, broad outlines. Firstly, it will be based on the mandate given to us by the First Minister. So the first question she poses to us is, what kind of country are we seeking to build? The second question is, how best can we overcome the challenges facing the country, and in particular those arising from Brexit? And thirdly, what further work needs to be carried out to ensure that we have an informed uh, citizenship? And this will be the, the focus of the work of the Assembly. It will, 120 people will be selected. There will be 100 people who will be the first group of Assembly uh, people. They will be randomly selected to represent a cross-section of Scottish society. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot apply to be a member. I know some people already asked me how you become one. It, because it's random, I'm afraid you have to wait for the letter uh, coming through the, the door. And, Anybody who's desperate to be part of it, I wish you uh, luck in that process. But it will be completely random. There will be no selection through political parties or any other uh, means. Its aim will be threefold, really. Firstly, there will be a learning process where we bring uh, experts, academics, practitioners and others in to talk to the members of the Assembly about the issues that we, we face and they will have the chance to cross-examine uh, those individuals. The second phase will then be internal, where the Assembly members will discuss with each other uh, what they think of the opinions that they've heard. And to take that beyond the normal, if you like, barrack room type discussions, there will be professional facilitators <laughs> to enable that discussion and hopefully help uh, draw the discussions together. And then thirdly, it will come out with recommendations. Given some of the coverage of this, I want to emphasise that this will be completely independent of government. Of course the government has set it up, and it gives it credibility that the government has set it up, because that gives it a status. But once established, I have had unequivocal assurances from the Minister responsible, from, from Mike Russell, that the two co-chairs will be independent and will manage the process themselves. No external political interference once it's established. It will also be as transparent as possible. We hope, for example, to have some of the deliberations uh, live streamed. We hope to have most of the documentation presented to the members of the Assembly available online. So we hope that as many people outside the room will be engaged in this process as is at all possible. Because the idea is not just to produce 100 better informed citizens, but to produce a better informed society as a whole, to see if there are ways that Scotland can come together, to see if there, there are issues on which there is consensus or at least overwhelming majority opinion uh, in, in this country. It will also try and make sure that once it comes to an end, there is a conclusion to the end, that it goes to 
an appropriate political body for further action. Let me just finish though by trying to make, in order to try and keep the political temperature down, try and make it very clear what this is not going to be about. It is not going to decide whether Scotland should have a second referendum because that's a matter for the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government and they have already legislated for that. It's not a matter about when the timing of that will be because that's a matter for the Scottish Parliament and the British Government, sorry, the Scottish Government and the British Government to negotiate. It's not even a matter about what the question should be and it's not also a matter of whether Scotland should be an independent country or not. What it is, is trying to involve and inform citizens in as active and proactive a way as possible so that when that choice comes, we're all better informed and all better able to make that decision. Thank you. So what I have to say is very different than what you've just heard. Um, my name is Louise and I was at home in my house one day in August 2016 and I got a knock on the door and it was a chap from a polling company and he started asking me some questions and would I like to be involved in this forum that's going to discuss um, some social issues and round table discussions. You have to go to a hotel once a month for a weekend and it's all going to form part of you know, some recommendations to government about the future of Ireland. And he mentioned a couple of the different topics and I thought, oh, okay, sounds interesting. Now I have to give you the context as well as I've been at home all summer uh, with my three kids. And this man was offering to bring me to a hotel once a month for a whole weekend <laughs> to talk to grown-ups about grown-up things. And I said, yes, sign me up. I don't care what it's about. I'll, I'll go. Um, that's the truth. Um, so that's how I got in the door. Uh, we weren't paid as, as assembly members. We volunteered our time. Um, so went along for the first weekend. Um, we had, I suppose, a few different topics. The first one is the one that's probably most widely uh, 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 most awareness about, which was the Eighth Amendment in our Constitution, which was Ireland's abortion laws. So that was the first topic we were given uh, to deliberate on. Very difficult topic, extremely divisive nationally, in the newspapers, in the church, in the media. We had had decades of strong division on this topic to the point where there was almost no discussion about it anymore. People just were afraid to even go there. Um, so as a topic we were, uh, we were nervous as citizens going in with this mandate. We thought, oh God, this is going to be really difficult. How are we going to manage this? Is it going to turn into a shouting shop or is it going to turn into something where it's just going to it's just going to be so difficult that we're never going to make any progress, that we're not going to get anywhere. So those were genuine fears that we all had going in at the start of the process. Um, from the outside, there was, I suppose, a mandate given by our Houses of Parliament to the Citizens' Assembly to come back with recommendations. And in that regard, we knew that what we were setting out to do was going to have some impact. It was going to go on to another stage after we had, we had, uh, we had made our recommendations. Our process was very straightforward in the sense that we met every once a weekend for over five weekends for the topic of the Eighth Amendment. Um, we had roundtable discussions, we had experts from both the pro-choice and the pro-life side. We were given very balanced information on, on all the different areas, so we had the medical background, we had the legal framework, we had the ethical framework, and then we had, you know, I suppose our own input into what our um, what our speakers were and what the the weekend ahead, what we needed to hear, what we needed to get us to the next step. So it was very much an involved process. Um, and at the end of it, then we made our recommendations, and our recommendations then went into a parliamentary committee. Um, and there was a quite a book full of recommendations, um, quite detailed, very um, I suppose very robust I would say and we all were very proud of the work that we had done and it went on to the next stage then which was a parliamentary committee and they basically did a mini assembly on, on the exact same topic in the exact same format that we, but sorry not the exact same format, a slightly different format and they came to pretty much the same conclusions that we had come to and then it went to a national referendum and the national referendum was basically 
pretty much, I think, within a percentage point or two, exactly as we had voted for, and we were 100 randomly selected citizens. So. so the main thing I'd like to say about the whole process of Citizens' Assembly is it's an opportunity, as Mike has just said, it's an opportunity to step outside the black and the white, to step outside the yes and the no, to step outside those polarised views and to sit in the grey area in the middle where most people would like to be and just try and figure out what can we do to move forward on this? What can we do to bring ourselves closer together to find common ground and to make recommendations that are going to enhance the day-to-day -day lives of the people of our country and also that they're going to be robust enough that they're going to stand up for the years to come. that one. Um, I always, always hate speaking after Louise because um, she says exactly what needs to be said. But let me just give a bit more of the context about the Irish case because the Citizens' Assembly that Louise described to you was the second Citizens' Assembly. We've had two of these now. So in 2012, the Irish government set up what was called a constitutional convention, but it was effectively a Citizens' Assembly with 66 citizens and 33 members of parliament. And they, just, they also spent about 14 months discussing a number of topics, the most prominent of which was marriage equality. So when we voted for uh, marriage equality in our referendum in 2015, that was also a product of a citizens' assembly type process. And so we've had two. We've produced a number, we've had a referendum on blasphemy, we've had major parliamentary reform. In a few months' time we're about to have a referendum on whether to extend voting rights to citizens living outside the state. And all of these have been outcomes of these citizens' assembly type approaches. So why Ireland? Why has Ireland had so many of these things? And I suppose that's, that's what, what I'll just spend a minute or two talking about, which is we had a, we had a severe crisis in 2010, 2009, 2010. The economic crisis affected a lot of European democracies, but I think there was a, a, a competition between Iceland and Ireland as to which democracy was the worst affected by the economic crash. I think we won that one. So we had a lot of very angry citizens huge amount of angry citizens on the streets or angry citizens who turn up to events uh, town hall type events quite legitimately complaining to the political classes about the mess that we found ourselves in so there were a couple of us who were saying well instead of having the angry citizens outside battering on the doors to come in why not try and bring the citizens into the room and that speaks to a wider debate about how democracies need to evolve democracies need to innovate Representative democracy, the election of our elected representatives, is at the heart of what democracy should be about. But we as citizens should have more to do than just vote every five years to kick the rascals out. We need to have some voice in democracy. And that's where citizens' assemblies can play a role, because as others have described, Louise and David in particular, if there's a random selection, like for jury duty, which happens all the time, a random selection, that it's, it's run in an objective and transparent and open process. We can see warts and all, anything that might be going wrong. To select 100 citizens, bring them into a room, not a room like this, you know, round tables. So in the Irish case, it was a ballroom, a hotel ballroom. They had wedding parties in the evening, and then the following day, the Citizens' Assembly would reconvene at the wedding table. But it was a round table with trained facilitators whose job was to make sure that the equivalent number of people as are, is in this room, I imagine, would each have an opportunity of fair voice, equal voice. And everyone in there was not representing anyone else but themselves. They won the lottery. They had the honour and privilege of being chosen by representatives of their government to come and have a serious discussion about the kind of, in our case, Ireland that they wanted to see. And I tell you, it worked. It worked. Louise is a personification of just how effective a process this can be in the sense that a citizen who hadn't much interest, I suspect, in this kind of endeavour before, clearly has enough interest to be turning up at events like this all the time to talk about and extol its virtues. So engaging citizens in a voice-centred democracy, moving beyond vote-centred democracy, is really what all of this is about and it, it's to be recommended. Thank you. back. So I'm, I'm going to add a level of challenge with my Spanish Edinburgh accent. Um, well, I, I want to start by saying how exciting it is that this is happening because 
we used to have events like this about this kind of democratic innovation happening somewhere else in the world. And there used to be a few of us, some of them still today in the room, but now we are many more. Um, and it has a lot to do with this particular moment in the history of democracy. Democracies all over the world are being challenged on two grounds, legitimacy grounds and capacity grounds. Does democracy, can, can it cope with the challenges of our time? Can it grapple with complexity at a time of politics done through uh, sound bites and um, superficial shallow exchanges? Um, and the answer is no, democracy does need to evolve. And indeed, democracy has never been a fixed thing. It does need to keep evolving. Um, it's important to note, uh, I suppose, I, I want to add the, the historical perspective, because in many ways I think we are setting up the foundations for the next 50 years of democratic development to meet the challenges of our time, climate change, um, uh, population displacement, and so on and so forth. And um, in Scotland, this kind of initiative is actually not new. I, I hear a lot of people in the media, um, and in social media in particular, um, framing this as something new that this particular government has pulled out of a hat. Uh, it couldn't be farther for the from the truth. We have been experimenting with these kind of processes at a smaller scale all over Scotland now for 20 years. Uh, partly in an agenda that was started by New Labour, embraced as well by others. Um, uh, the Greens have been very prominent in that agenda. The Lib Dems have been very prominent in that agenda. So this is something that has belonged to all political parties who are searching for new ways of improving the capacity of representative democracy. And that has been the story in Scotland. Uh, some people want to frame this as a top-down thing, but if you look back, you, you could think about a number of milestones from the, the, the demo max um, process to um, uh, take stock of where Scottish democracy is, that was facilitated by the Electoral Reform Society, we have the Christie Commission, we have the COSLA Commission on strengthening local democracy. We've been talking about democracy for a very long time and experimenting with some of these new formats. And as it happens, this assembly is called forth by the current government, uh, but there is qualified support by Labour and the Greens, and hopefully others will come into the platform uh, once they begin to look at the assembly and its own merits. Um, uh, but the point that David made earlier is really important. Um, you know, people criticize the notion of a top-down initiative, but then people often criticize those initiatives that are bottom-up, but then don't have an influence. So you can't win. You either get something that is properly connected to the system so that hopefully it has some kind of systemic effect, or you create something that is separate from the system and hope that it might have some kind of effect. Um, I suppose I want to finish reflecting on the, the challenge. There are a number of challenges. Um, everyone is going to be challenged through this process. Citizens are going to be challenged to engage with politics in a way that is different from party politics. Politicians are going to be challenged to engage with all of this through a lens that is uh, different from the partisan lens. Journalists are going to be challenged to find a way of telling the story of these complex, interesting spaces where really deep dialogue takes place and how to turn that into stories that still compel and mobilize people out there to engage in the conversation. Um, and so on and so forth. So we are all going to be challenged because in many ways this is uh, new. Uh, but it is an opportunity for us to recognize that representative democracy needs help. If we care about representative democracy, we need to improve its legitimacy and we need to improve its capacity to cope with problems. Um, and I, in a sense, the, the final point I will make, often people, um, one of the questions I get the most is, so how is this different from populism? All this notion about participatory democracy, deliberative democracy, how is this different from populism? And uh, the, the answer is they couldn't be more different. Um, but the kind of destructive populism we see around the world is a dynamic of leaders and followers because populism is about mobilizing, it's about creating followership. Participatory democracy is about creating a new form of citizenship, more engaged, where every citizen is not a follower of a campaign or a particular cause, but a contributor to an ongoing public conversation. So bottom line for me is this is an opportunity to show in Scotland that politics can be more than party politics and democracy more than representative democracy.
Well, um, I feel like the phony on the panel here because uh, I haven't actually been part of a formal uh, citizens' assembly, but was, was the speaker, as was said earlier, of the People's Parliament. Is anyone old enough and sad enough to have watched that? <laughs> Hello, Esther. Uh, yeah, it was on at 7 o'clock on Saturday nights, right? That's how popular Channel 4 thought that programme was going to be. It was up against every other entertainment offer. But it was a very interesting idea. Back in 1994, the idea was that when the proper parliament disappeared, this People's Parliament would be convened. It was set in Manchester. It was mostly uh, people from Manchester and Salford. They don't hold back, right? They're a feisty bunch. So they were selected very carefully. It was a very painstaking process for a, for a broadcaster, actually. I've never seen anything like it again. Um, and it was a complete cross-section of the population. We discussed uh, drug use with a guy who was actually high on heroin at the time as a member of the parliament. Nobody could actually tell what his state was because he actually coped with his kind of use extremely well, which was quite unsettling. Um, we had all sorts of people who had experience of the things we were talking about. In essence, we had people who were experiencing every aspect of life not being commentators upon it. And so much of decision making, um, whether it is professionals or politicians or the commentariat, are people who have near a scooby in terms of direct experience of particular problems who are brought to bear upon it. And the people who are right there in the centre of it, their views are only getting there through the mediation of the great and the good. So the, the kind of shock to the system of the People's Parliament was that this was actually a very uh, bouncy bunch of people who were shooting straight from the hip, grew in confidence all the time, and interestingly, when they had the chance to sit in select committees and call witnesses, began to change their opinions quite dramatically. I remember one in particular which was about uh, community notification of paedophiles in your area. Right, 100 people, uh, the, probably at the beginning there would have been 98 people saying, we want to know, because we always took a vote at the start. After they'd gone through a process of listening to all sorts of witnesses, some of them taken from the United States where a similar sort of law already existed, they began to realise all the, the downfalls and pitfalls there were of that kind of knowledge. All the vigilante gangs that were set up, all the people taking the law into their own hands and getting it wrong, all the kind of lawlessness that began to spiral out of control, all the hurt that came with families of people who were suspected of being paedophiles, who never had rest again. It was extraordinary. By the end of it, it had completely changed people's points of view. And sitting through that for five years, yes, that's how long we managed to stumble along at seven o'clock on a Saturday night. Um, it, it was quite, a, it, no matter what the bunch of people, and this is what really made me such a believer in people power actually, because no matter what, it was a different set of people each year. It didn't matter. It was the people, the strength was inherent in the random selection of the people. It wasn't that they were carefully selected to be the smarty people of the, of the room. It was the averageness of the group that was stunning and it was, when, when it was properly facilitated, it was the wisdom of crowds in action in front of you. And it changed me. I mean, funnily enough, at the same time, um, I was also a trustee of the Isle of Egg Trust, who some of you may know are the, is the island on the west coast that went on to do a community buyout of the island, the first islanders in Scottish history, to buy their island back from an absentee landowner. So I was watching people power in another aspect because everyone thought those little people would never be capable of running their own island. In fact, no one believed that more firmly than them. <laughs> and the result of having um, belief in yourself, first of all, the power to change things, it is extraordinary what then the diversity of people that are in the room can bring to a problem that politicians have allowed red lines to kill. And we're seeing this with Brexit now, a difficult problem for sure, but one which is so riven by red lines that parties cannot cross. 
If they were normal human beings, you know, if they took their party capacities off and sat as normal problem-solving human beings, there might, might just be a bit more daylight getting into the equation. But an important point that I understood from listening to David the first time I heard you in Oxford was what that point was the difficulty that party politicians have in setting aside red lines. Bear in mind that every party politician must be elected by showing a clear difference between them and the guy next door or the woman next door, even though they probably agree on just about everything. So party politics is designed to create division where it doesn't exist. And lots of our most difficult problems don't get solved because of that. The other final thing I want to say, another thing that David had said, was about the role of professionals. In the Citizens' Assembly, I think this is a great phrase, they're on tap, not on top. Now that matters a lot because without kind of, you know, getting stuck, I, I, I guess I'm a professional journalist, but um, there is a way that professionals have managed to kind of commandeer an awful lot of the public civic space and debate which ought to be wider uh, spread. And in Scotland, I find a class divide still exists where working people are worried about voicing up. Lots of minorities are worried about sounding a bit stupid. Um, and people defer to people who sound like they know what they're talking about. And we lose so much expertise, insight, experience, and, and buy-in from our population because the, the, the loudest people get to sound off, one of whom is about to now shut up. Um, <laughs> and I just think this will be potentially the making of our country that has been top down too long. Everyone, and what a great note to throw this out to the audience for questions. So I'm going to take one question at a time. Um, so please be brief with the questions, and we'll try and be brief with the answers so we can get lots of debate going. So who has a question for our panellists? This lady. Do you have a microphone? You need to shout, lass. We're not hearing you. So that was a question about how the cross-section of society that will make up the citizens, members of the assembly, how um, how that will be a cross-section, how that randomness is decided. So if we hear perhaps from David and then um, perhaps the other David could fill us in on some of the Irish experience on that as well. It will be done firstly not by myself, not by politicians, but by a professional body uh, contracted to, to do this and they will do it on the basis of age uh, and in this context we're saying from 16 upwards uh, and so in the same proportion as 16 to 25 year olds as there are in society, same proportion of 60, over 60 year olds and so on. 50-50 in terms of male and female, in terms of gender balance. It will be done in terms of socio-economic uh, class to make sure that we have all stratas of society uh, represented, ethnic uh, representation and so on. It's not going to be easy, but the objective is to have essentially a microcosm of Scottish society. Uh, and that, that is the mandate of the uh, contractors to go out and find such a group of people. Uh, I repeat, it's not easy, and David will say more about the challenges the Irish faced in, in achieving this, but as, as we heard from Louise, the uh, Citizens' Assembly on abortion came out with exactly the same proportion, almost exactly the same proportion, inside the Assembly as reflected general society. Now, that may have been luck, but it doesn't sound like luck to me. It sounds like they were a genuine microcosm of Irish society. I mean, I, I won't add much except to agree that that's, that's effectively the Irish process was a version of that. Um, and, uh, you know, the vote on abortion w reflected very closely the vote of the Citizens' Assembly 
when they voted on abortion. So the Citizens' Assembly were very similar to the views of the Irish population. And the same thing happened when they discussed marriage equality, that there was a similarity. So you, you, it's a random selection. It's done in such a way that you guarantee 50% of the people in the room are women. You, you guarantee good regional spread, uh, good um, spread in terms of different age groups, and good spread in terms of socioeconomic background. So you try to get a good stratification of society. Thank you. Another question. Um, I was wanting to ask, um, it's, it's very clear what the Irish um, topic was on abortion and the other topics. It seems very vague that the topics have been put forward by the Scottish Government. How on earth are you going to get clear, concrete proposals coming out of that? It's, it's, a, a, it's a really good <laughs> question, something I'm grappling with my, myself. Um, in part, the answer, in part, the answer will lie with the. Sorry, oh, you need the question. Yeah. Sorry, the question was essentially uh, the Irish question seemed to be more focused, if I'm paraphrasing correctly, whereas this seems to be a much wider uh, question. Uh, and I agree that it is at the moment the remit is quite broad, and part of the answer will come from I hope the assembly itself, because the whole idea is to empower the hundred people. And at one of our early meetings, probably not the first meeting, because you need people to get to know each other and to get to know how the system works, but second or third time we meet, I hope we will be able to narrow the question down and look at it in a more focused uh, way. Now, I, I'm reluctant to say too much because my partner, my co-convener, has not yet been appointed and I don't want to speak for the two of us, but there's a, some examples you could give. I'm not saying any of these will be the ones we use. But, say climate change or uh, challenges facing the economy or migration policy for example, we could examine post Brexit, if Brexit happens, uh, there's going to be a significant change in the freedom of movement of individuals. Um, that is going to be a particular challenge for Scotland because we need uh, more, we're, we, we had been a declining population without the European uh, citizens who have come into this country, we're an elderly population, we have care needs, we have needs in terms of uh, the service sector and, uh, and so on, particularly hospitality. And there seems to be a consensus in Scotland that we need a different immigration policy from the rest of the United Kingdom. So this is only an example, because I'm not saying this was what the Assembly will do, but as an illustrative point, the Assembly could firstly look at this, examine this, to see if that proposition holds up. Is there, is there a need for a separate Scottish system? If it comes to the conclusion there is, it could then look at how that might be delivered and establish whether there's any constitutional impediments to delivering that. So do you need more devolution? Do you need, a, do you need independence of a separate uh, policy? But to examine it and to come to conclusions and to come to recommendations at the end of the process. You could think of a similar process with climate change or uh, aspects of the economy or uh, human rights or many other issues. But I'm just using that one as a, as a, to, just to emphasise as an illustration at the moment. Um, Last stand here, so I can make it easier. Yeah. So I, I was wondering actually whether that might be almost like a strength, the fact that um, a high level question or topic might be quite broad, because one can imagine that a whole load of uh, smaller questions would cascade out of that. But then that raises questions about um, how that's then developed within the assembly. So I was wondering if you could say something about checks and balances. So one of the models that I was reading up on uh, just yesterday was this notion of like an oversight body, an advisory panel, and then the coordinating group, and what the relationship between those different bodies might be. So. I mean, <laughs> <okay>. Yes. <laughs> There's going to be a number of, as you indicate, a number of bodies. Firstly, the co-chairs will be responsible for once the, the process is handed over to us for the administration of the uh, assembly, for the con conduct of the assembly, it will be assisted by uh, a group of advisors who will advise us. And that is, they will not be uh, telling us what to do, they will be advising us on the way the assembly should operate. There will be a secretariat made up largely of, of civil servants, but again, uh, for the purpose of this, moved out of government. They will not be sitting in St Andrew's House or in Victoria Quay. They will be uh, 
possibly somewhere near here, but I'm not at liberty to say that anymore. But they will be outside uh, of the, the government structure, and they will be responsible for the management of the set, for the day-to-day -day running of the assembly to make sure that uh, the co-chairs have what they need in terms of uh, the conduct of the assembly, the assembly people get their, uh, their expenses, make sure the hotels are booked, make sure that the administration is, is done and so on. Uh, and there will be researchers studying this process so that conclusions can be drawn at the end of it. Now, all of this is starting to come into shape. There will also be, uh, there's a contract tender going out for people to do the, the media on this as well. So there will be a media, media agency to make sure that the uh, work of the assembly is, is uh, dispersed to the widest group of people as possible. Uh, so it's kind of coming together. And I don't know if I don't want to put David in the spot, but it's based largely on because the Irish learned by experience in terms of this, it's based largely on what the Irish were doing towards the end of their process. I mean, we're still, uh, I said at the very beginning, I don't want to be too definitive here because uh, we're still in a negotiating phase. I don't have my co-chair yet, so nothing is set in concrete, but we're working largely towards the Irish model. Yeah, no, it's, it's largely that, yeah. Great, let's have another question from the back, I'll take the lady in the yellow top. Okay, so this question about could the Constitution Assembly consider broad values as opposed to more specific questions? Um, perhaps Oliver, would you answer yeah, that? Yeah, maybe the best example of that was the model in Iceland, but it was a very different setup. It was on constitutional issues, and they had a very short time, so they, they, because there were a number of different bodies. The assembly was just one, then there was a constitutional convention, there, was, there were a number of things. But the job of the assembly was to come together for a very short period of time and focus on the kind of values that should underpin their new constitution. So it is being done. And usually in this kind of process, um, there is some time invested at the beginning in developing a sense of the values that might guide the way people want to approach uh, the evidence, the testimonies, and the task. But yeah, until we know the specifics of the task, it's really hard to, to see whether there's a place for that in the design, I, I would say. And some of the organizers and designers are in the room, so um, uh, they might be able to add to that. So just sort of going back, I'm sorry to go back that way, but just one thing in terms of the earlier question. I forgot to mention, because, and this is important, there will be professional facilitators. Uh, and the importance of that is to help people uh, ensure that everybody, the 100 individuals, all have an equal voice in this, this process and that the discussion is held in a, an orderly and constructive way. So it may, not, it may sound a bit pedantic to have come back to mention this, but it's an important part of the, the process because it's where it delivers, it, where it differs from many other ordinary discussions, as it were. It's, it's, it's getting people together with a clear set of objectives and, and a clear uh, mandate in terms of their uh, clear ability to, to communicate with, with one another. Um, just on the... I've never forgotten what it was. There's something you said all the world I was going to... Values? Values, yeah. Again, I don't, I don't see any reason why the Assembly could not do that. But also, I think it's important to also understand that while it has a broad mandate, the Assembly will be able to set its own agenda uh, within the mandate. And if the Assembly wants, feels that's something important to discuss, then it will be free to do so. It's not, it's, you know, again, somebody used the expression, it's not a, a top-down process. It has a mandate, but within that mandate, it's free to operate how it, how it wishes. Do you want to know where, where it goes from? Uh, this, again, this is off the cuff, uh, not off the cuff, but this is my own personal view. Uh, the assembly has been set up by the government. I personally don't think it should report back to the government, but I think it should report back to the Scottish Parliament. And it should be for the Scottish Parliament to decide what it does with the recommendations. Joanna, did you I, I just wanted to come, come in on that question because, as Oliver said, this isn't a completely new idea that's just sprung up in the last few months. And at the end of last year, the First Minister's advisory group on a human rights framework for Scotland reported 
into the First Minister and they talked about the sort of framework we might want for Scotland going forward as a devolved country, uh, looking to the future also. And one of the things they proposed in their recommendations was a citizens' assembly to look at the sort of human rights that we might, we might, we might want to include in Scotland in a codification or, or, or a framework. Because you know there's a very live debate now in, 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 in debate about human rights as to whether one would confine oneself to the rights in the ECHR, you know, the important rights like the right to life, the right to a free trial, or whether one would go beyond that as some of the Scandinavian constitutions and the new South African constitution have done to include socio-economic rights. So that was one recommendation that was made. And I would very much hope that if this first Citizens' Assembly that the Scottish Government are going to set up over the autumn is a success, there will be further Citizens' Assemblies, as there have been in Ireland. The first one looked at abortion, and there have been a number of other ones looking at climate change, the challenges of an ageing population various constitutional issues in Ireland. So I would very much hope that going forward we could have citizens' assemblies to look at other issues, and that's one recommendation that the Scottish Government has already received. Okay. Let's have another question. Um, come down. Uh, lots of people. So I'll get round to everyone if I can. This gentleman here. I'm assuming that the media role and responsibility in all this. So, it sounds clear that the people who are selected to be participants, they will rise to the occasion and probably surprise themselves about how good they are. How has there been any consideration as to how the media will be encouraged to rise to the occasion as well? And for them to <laughs> <laughs> I take it from the round everyone heard that question. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, probably I'm the least good person to answer on this because I, I'm just interested and I'm actually just partisan <coughs> in the sense that I have huge reservoirs of belief and curiosity about anything that's set up as a kind of structure that lets people's you know, innate common sense come to the fore. There's a row of journalists there. <laughs> Hello, guys. <laughs> I mean, maybe you could answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually, this is a, I'm serious because you know, uh, you're all. You're, it's great that you're here because an awful lot of kind of alternative politics is generally by the mainstream media is look, looked upon as you know a bit flaky a bit open-toed sandal kind of stuff. And actually, it can be quite hard to convince an editor that you should come to something in the evening as well, which is kind of like, great. Um, but have you any thoughts? In general, when I'm covering an event, uh, I'm here to listen rather than to speak. So uh, you'll have, next time we have to invite us up there to, to, to tell what we well, think. I mean, I, I think that, it, well, you guys really, there's, there's thoughts, you, you, you've thought through actually what to do about much of this, because clearly anybody who's going into this citizens assembly doesn't want to feel that they're in a, a circus where their you know, primary objective of somebody is to make them part of a TV programme or any kind of media spotlight that they just don't want to have. And the, pr the totally most important thing is that people come forward who are randomly selected and feel confident that they can just do the thing in front of them, which is uh, be part of the Citizens' Assembly and not have to become a media star in the, in the meantime, or be subjected to any of the criticism that there might be about their politics, their past, their orientations, any of that nonsense. Um, so th there's thoughts which these guys will describe about how to run this assembly so that really it isn't sort of something the media should be in, it, you know, coming into if, if I, too much. However, the point is to let everybody in Scotland know what's going on. I would like to see you guys, when you get your co convener, going and speaking to Donaldo McKinnon, uh, the controller of BBC Scotland, and asking for a weekly slot on Reporting Scotland to have an update of what's been happening. And the same thing on STV. Um, there can be wider social media stuff as well although that does raise problems which were encountered in the Irish Citizens' Assembly. So let me just pass over to these folk because they've already been through this one. 
David, I, I, I suppose one way to, um, I mean, and I, I really take your, your question, I get blind with the crowds uh, on, on board. I mean, you know, a lot of this is presented as a challenge to the political class. And in due fairness to the colleagues in the second row there, it's an even greater challenge to the media class. Because you have to, you have to reconfigure how democracy supposedly is meant to operate, which means change the mindset of, I'm sure it's, it's not you guys, but there would be other journalists who have a mindset that says in representative democracy is the job of our professional elected politicians to represent us, it's the job of the citizens, as I said earlier on, to kick the rascals out every five years. How can we trust citizens? I mean, this was the charge we had when we were trying this out in Ireland originally in 2011. Citizens? Ordinary citizens? You're going to get them to come into a room and discuss complex matters? Are you mad? Um, or, you know, we have a citizens' assembly. It's called our parliament down the road. They're there for that reason. Why should we entrust work like this to other people? Let the politicians do the job. So the challenge in the Irish process was to get the media to turn up just to come. And I, 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 among others, would always say to the journalists that one could get to meet at the odd reception, just come to one weekend, just sit in the back of the room. And I'd say that to anyone in this room when the Citizens' Assembly is up and running, because I imagine like the Irish process, there will be room for observers. Sit in the room for one weekend, even if you're critical or cynical about the process, and just experience the mood music in that room of regular citizens, ordinary citizens is an insult, regular citizens, citizens from all walks of life, you know, highly trained, not so trained, people who have been to university, not to university, people who are unemployed, people who have never been employed, people who can barely speak English in some cases. Just watch how they evolve as citizens when given an opportunity to become educated and informed. And the challenge in particular is to the journalists to make that journey to wherever the headquarters of this operation is and just witness it. Another question. Uh, take that gentleman there in the black jacket. Simple question. Uh, it's been reported quite widely already in the media that uh, the Scottish Tories and Scottish Lib Dems are refusing to support this. <coughs> what <coughs> if any is that going to happen? Okay, that was a question about uh, getting this cross-party sign-up. So, David, perhaps you could... Um, I, I hope they will change their, their mind, and I hope one of the ways of doing that will be to convince them first that this is genuinely an attempt to have a conversation across the whole of uh, Scottish public opinion, that it will be transparent, that the government will step back, and again, I repeat, I've had assurances that once it's established, the government will have nothing to do with the process, obviously they're funding it, but beyond that, once it's started, it will be separate and uh, neutral in terms of its approach to, to government. I also understand why they've taken this attitude, it's partly because of the toxic nature of uh, Scottish politics at the moment, and that's exactly why we need a citizens' assembly, because we're trying to lower the temperature in, in Scottish politics, we're trying to get a dialogue going, and therefore they should uh, also contemplate that aspect of it. Uh, but also, um, again, speaking personally, not as necessarily the co-chair, I think with hindsight it was a mistake to announce this as part of a, uh, a three uh, course, course of action package. It was announced at the same time as the Indy 2 uh, debate, it was announced at the same time as the cross-party talks on uh, constitutional the constitutional situation and then the assembly was thrown in and I think throwing the three things together created some suspicion. I want to keep assuring all the political parties that they don't need to be suspicious about this. This is a conversation that they should want to be part of. If they don't take part then nothing changes because uh, this is a keep saying the name, but this is a citizens assembly. There is no formal role for the political parties anyway, other than we have offered the chance for political parties to have a political panel uh, to be on hand to answer questions if the citizens assembly wishes. Not to make proactive contributions, but to answer questions if, if asked. So all they're doing is losing that opportunity. So I do hope they will reflect, and I do think uh, the Irish experience shows that as part of many other things going on in politics, this is going to be the way forward in terms of political dialogue in the future, and I think they will come to regret not being part of it. Thank you. Thank you. I think Oliver wants to come yeah, on that and then John. Yeah, just very briefly. Uh, I think 
parties who at the moment are very suspicious and don't want to support this, they need to be reminded that this kind of process has been supported by them in other circumstances and situations. The Lib Dems have advocated for citizens' assemblies. A again, I think Joanna mentioned that Rory Stewart, uh, the Conservative MP, has advocated for citizens' assemblies. So like with any institution, you cannot just have that institution where it's convenient to you. So once the standards and assurances and the independence and the um, quality standards that need to be there and the benchmarks to have faith in the process and its legitimacy, once all of that is clear, I will hope that the Conservatives and the Lib Dems would come back uh, into this space because otherwise what is the argument against it? Yeah, I mean, I'm just, what Oliver said, I mean, I know Conservatives who think this is a great idea and I know members of the Lib Dems who think it's a great idea and have supported it in other situations and it was interesting to hear Vince Cable on the radio this morning talking about the power of putting political differences aside in Wales in this coming, upcoming by-election, the Welsh Nationalists and the Greens have stood aside uh, to enable a Lib Dem candidate, just as the Lib Dems stand aside in Caroline Lucas's seat to give her uh, a free run in, in Brighton Pavilion. So, and there's been a lot of cross-party working behind the scenes. We're about to have another big cross-party onslaught in Westminster this week to try and, and stop a, a no deal. So I would hope that as the remit becomes more focused, that other parties will feel able uh, to buy into this. And I, I think David's point at the beginning is absolutely crucial. The Citizens' Assembly is not about whether or not Scotland should become an independent country. My personal view is that having a Citizens' Assembly may assist on that path. Others may think it may underline that devolution that we have is enough. Who knows? But David's crucial point is it's not about whether or not we become independent. There has already been, the Scottish Parliament has already voted to hold another independence referendum. It has a mandate to do so. The crucial issue is the negotiations that require to come with the British government. So this, the citizens aren't being allowed to, aren't being asked to solve this thorny problem. The citizens of the whole of Scotland will be asked to solve this thorny problem in a second independence referendum at a time yet to be determined, although the First Minister has said that she would like to be that, that to be in the second half of next year. So I would really hope that as the process of defining the remit occurs over the summer, people from the Lib Dems and the Conservatives, if not the whole of the official parties, will be able to buy into it. Hi, um, my question will join um, uh, a little bit the question about uh, the journalism and how they will report those uh, those uh, uh, citizens' assembly. Um, I would like to know if there were other means for the public in general to to have access on what's going on in the. And uh, the, the the full uh, the full uh, report of the, the those uh, uh, those assemblies. Thank you. It's a question about how the public will know what's going on. So um, if we could hear from David and perhaps also the other David on what happened in uh, Ireland as well. Yeah, very very briefly. Firstly, we hope that all the evidence, all the documentation, depending on the volume, of course, but. The aim will be to have all the documentation online and available to anyone who wishes to, to read it. We also hope that the deliberative sessions and the, sorry, the expert opinion sessions will be live streamed so that people can hear what the experts are saying. And the final conclusion, of course, the final report will be a public document. Uh, so we aim for maximum transparency in this process. We're also looking at ways uh, <coughs> still feeling our way a bit here, but we're looking for ways that the public, the general public, can take part in the process as well through social media and other, and other areas. I mean, that was large to the Irish process. The only thing that I would add is that the website of the Citizens' Assembly contained a, a very easy to access tab where members of the public, advocates, interest groups, anyone who wanted to could submit their views and those went up immediately. So openness and transparency is the name of the game. If this is going to work, properly it has to be open and transparent and I'm very confident that that's what will happen. Just to add, I'm hoping, but I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm hoping that there will also be a role for some of the already existing non-partisan networks, civil society networks across the country to create spaces out there in communities to hold parallel conversations and in some way 
fit that into the assembly. It comes down to design, and those are difficult decisions given the time constraints. So the co-chairs and the stewarding group, they are going to have a challenge with design. Uh, it might well be that we have to settle um, on just a viable version given the constraints and, and keep learning so that the next time we can keep adding. But I would hope that there's a broader public engagement space. Okay. Another question. Uh, this lady in the leather jacket there. Can I just ask a question? You mentioned there are a lot of things about the, the concession uh, facilitation. Can I just ask what kind of people are going to be doing that and what expertise is going to have? Because having, I've just retired from 30 years of community development work and I know that that relationship between the facilitators and the, and the group is really crucial if you're going to get decent, you know, from that. Yeah, it's been tendered for the, the, the present time, but maybe Oliver could say more about the kind of expertise that they would have. Yeah, I mean, facilitators do something really difficult, which is to create a space where everyone feels they have something to contribute, where there are no dominant voices, no polarizing exchanges, no rehearsed monologues, not the shallow exchanges that we see every day out there in standard public forums. So it's a really difficult role because they are trying to disrupt the power inequalities that are brought into the room by the different levels of confidence and experience and expertise that will be brought together. Um, I, in Scotland, we have a proud tradition of community education, community learning and development. We have lots of facilitators, as you saw them in the, in the room here, who have already uh, done this for a very long time. Uh, so it has to be people who have a long term experience of facilitation, who understand that everything else kind of depends on good quality facilitation. And uh, I don't know the details of how the Secretariat is going to set that up, but I do know that there is a, a tremendous pool and network of facilitators who have been already mobilized before um, in similar processes here and elsewhere. So, um, yeah, th to be honest with you, that side of things worries me less than the more uh, the stuff to do with um, you know party politics and and, and the media uh, challenge of, of narrating this kind of a space. Well, if it might, if it, if it wouldn't be less, I didn't think it was being tendered for. I mean, who, who, when, when is it being tendered? Who's, who's going to you know? Is that a company? Is that a, it's a public consultancy? It's a public contract. It's like <laughs> yeah. So anybody who, any organisation has experience in facilitation is able to, to apply. But I'm not, I didn't just throw that away because I throw it to Oliver because I wanted to avoid the question. I'm not engaged, I'm not involved in, in the tendering and that would be based on the, their expertise. The, the most important, I just want to say, the most important role of the facilitator is to be impartial, yeah. right? But not neutral. So impartial on the content, but not neutral in terms of the dynamics. If there are inequalities that are transpiring in the conversation, facilitators intervene. If things are going quite well, they just have help the group to find their own way into the issues. So all those standards will be there. And you know, people involved in doing the research around all of this, we will be keeping a very close eye on that dimension because a lot of um, the, the, the process really depends on this. Okay, uh, let's have a question from the gentleman in the grey jacket. Um, Mark McLaughlin from the Times. Um, I'll have a wee go at answering some of the questions that the panel or the people in the audience have asked about the press. If a consensus emerges around an issue, you will get buy-in from the press. I'll use an example. Um, the Scottish Affairs Committee has been discussing the decriminalisation of drugs. It's a hugely divisive issue, um, but a consensus is emerging that this is the right thing for Scotland. Um, on Tuesday, a very senior police officer went to the committee and said this is what we need. Um, the Times put it on the front page. The Daily Record did uh, an editorial saying this is what we need to do. So the media is led by the issues. Um, the problem the media has got right now is because it is so polarised that whatever you write, you, you can't win. Because one side will say, you didn't say that right, that doesn't reflect my world view. So if the Citizens' Assembly can have a consensus, the media will be led by the issues. Um, the question that I have goes back to this issue about the, the buy-in from the unionist parties. There's already chat of them telling their supporters to, to boycott this. So how do you make sure, if this, if this continues, that the people that you select at random 
I'm presuming you're not going to press gang them. They just take the application, put it in the bin, and say, I'm having nothing to do with that. And, and you don't end up with a citizens, citizens assembly full of essentially left wing nationalists. <laughs> <laughs> The left wing part I might be comfortable with. It. <laughs> no, uh, we, I mean, the, the, the selection process will be very careful, but the, the point you make is an interesting one. It's one we, and again, this will be my decision because we want to be hands off to make sure it is a random selected group of people. But there is, has been a debate about whether you ask people for their political views. But that has a danger um, because you don't want to, in that sense, you want a cross section of Scottish society. But you don't want to replicate the political divisions in Scottish society. Um, so, how do you do the two things at once? Uh, and it's, it's, there's no easy answer to that question. Also, uh, dare I say, BBC Question Time perhaps suggests that some audience members lie about their political affiliations when they're being recruited. So how, how do we know that people, when they're asked what their political affiliation are, are telling us the truth, whereas you know what socio-economic class are, you know what ethnicity they are? So my hope is simply selecting 100 people at random will get a genuine cross-sex of society. And obviously if we pick up that there's a serious boycott as a result of the two major political parties, then we might have to look at this again, but I actually don't think there will be. I don't think political parties saying they're not willing to take part will actually make much difference to the ordinary citizen, no matter their political views, because they want their people to be heard. They want their voices to be heard in, the, in this process. And maybe you could say more about that, Louise, in terms of you had no political axe to grind when you were invited. No, and I think it's very important to, to say that even in the Irish process, there was obviously a very clear pro-life, pro-choice. I mean, that's as divisive as you're ever going to get on a topic. And we weren't polled at entry on how we would have voted if we had to vote on the first day. We weren't polled. Um, I would say that there were some people who came in as no, and there were some people who came in as yes. And then there was a whole bunch of people who came in going, yeah, maybe no, maybe I'm not sure, I don't know, I'm not, I, yeah, but no, but not but then, but oh, oh, oh. oh. And that is where most people actually sat. They didn't sit in the black or the white. They sat in that kind of grey area in the middle going, I don't know. And the process of the deep learning and the space and the time and the expertise over five full weekends changed a lot of people from that, I'm not sure, to, OK, I see. This is what we need to do. This is how we need to do it. And that's what it's going to look like. If it just did. The magic is in the activity of doing it, of getting normal people, getting an expert panel, expert speakers, balanced speakers. You know, balanced speakers as in we had a pro-choice speaker, we had a pro-life speaker, we had, you know, a medical expert on this side, a medical expert on that side, an ethicist on this side, an ethicist on that side. And that was the way the whole thing was ran. And we had very, very serious discussions, deliberations that took the stuffing out of us, to be honest with you, it really did. Um, but we were very proud of what we came up with at the end, and in fact we were quite shocked ourselves when we did the vote on the last day. We ourselves, as a hundred people, couldn't believe what we voted for. Because we weren't sitting around going, well I'm voting yes for that, I'm voting no for that. We were still asking questions right up to the last minute. We, people assume that a citizens' assembly is a talking shop of people just talking at each other. It's actually not. It's people sitting going, what did he just say? No. And how is that related to what that other person said last week? And what? And if we put that and that together, then what does that mean? Or oh, oh, that? Oh, see, two, nobody's joining those two things together. Why is nobody talking about that? Okay, we need to write that down. And do, do you know? Do you understand what I mean? So, so it is people who may have strong views either way, but are open to discussing and open to those views changing. Some dramatically, some just a little bit. Can I just piggyback on that? Because I want to go back to the, your opening remarks. Um, because it wasn't evident on the fifth weekend where the mood was going in the room. And even it was quite late in the fifth weekend. So if the journalistic mantra, and I'm sorry if I appear critical, but I've had a couple of years of this now to deal with in Ireland. If the journalistic mantra is to say, well, we'll wait until we see what consensus is emerging, you're going to miss the point. 
And the point is the process. You have to witness the process. I'm going to take some other questions, but Joanna, you wanted to just... Yeah, okay, lovely. So I'll take this gentleman with the... Just while we're there. Follow on to the, um, what you were talking about there. You had a very clear question. It was a yes and no type answer scenario. Um, I, as somebody asked earlier, I'm just concerned these questions are so vague that this is going to be a bit of a talking shop that leads to nothing. So are you... You know, would you have engaged in this... Um, Citizen Assembly, if the questions had been as vague as this. And I'm not a journalist, by the way. <laughs> we like journalists, by the way. <laughs> I mean, I don't want this to turn into a star. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, so it, it wasn't. To be honest with you, it wasn't vague. Um, the, in the media, it seemed like it was a yes or no. But once we got past that polarised kind of idea of both sides, okay? So, but it's a very focused. It, it definitely was, but it was also very, very broad. And if you look at the recommendations we made, they're very detailed based on time frames, circumstances, situations, medical, legal, ethical. There's a whole bunch of stuff that all went into that. So the framework for that, I understand that the topic was, was, was narrow enough in the sense that you know, it was a topic. But it's not to say that you can't start with a broader topic. I mean, we started with current lie of the land in Ireland in relation to abortion. Yeah. And then we had to go, right, well, what do we need to do next? And what do we need so to do next? The context here is so obviously um, the Brexit bomb going off shortly, um, the debate on Scottish independence, and timing of the assembly. Um, I'm just a bit sceptical that this is going to achieve anything in the time scales within which it needs to achieve something. And if the questions are so vague, I, I'm not quite getting the purpose of this. You're not entirely wrong in what you say, in that we accept that the, the, the mandate given is broad, but that was intentional to some extent. The work of the co-conveners firstly, and then the assembly itself, will be to narrow that and to focus it. And as I said earlier, I'm not to say too much because I don't want to give my views and find out my co-convener disagrees with me. But until we've got the co-convener, it's hard to be very definitive on this. But we, we do, we are working ways where we can get a, a narrower set of questions and therefore a more usable set of answers as well, we hope. Just, you know, it's, there's a double edge to having a really specific question. Because if the question is already very specific, then we know that power is built into how a question is asked. So if David and, and the new co-convener were given something very narrow, already framed and highly polished, that came in a very top-down way, that will present its own challenges. But it is true that this needs to be brought down to a level where these citizens can engage with it and produce something that is useful and usable. And for that, it needs to be a little bit more specific. Uh, it's just that it's early days because that's not a job for the co-chair. Usually, that there is some kind of oversight, oversight panel or a stewarding board that includes people already who represent a spectrum of people in civil society and in politics to develop and refine the task so that it's, 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 you know, so that, that the power that goes into shaping the specific task is shared beyond what government says or the chair say, the co-chair say. So we're in a tricky situation. I do feel for David because there are a lot of things that David cannot yet um, uh, share because um, we are in the early stages and, and the co-chair needs to come in and yeah. Just before I go to another question, I'm going to read a question that's been sent in. Um, this might be one for Louise. Um, Rudy says there were 12,000 submissions on the topic of the Irish Citizens' Assembly. How did the Assembly manage to integrate these views into the discussion process? Could you share some of your reflections yeah, on that? Yeah, so that was a lot. Um, we, we, we were, I, I, as far as I remember, um, David, you might be able to verify this. Uh, we, we received basically a, a, like a, a small phone book of printed submissions. Um, now obviously it would have taken a full weekend alone to read those, but I actually think that the majority of people read through a lot of them. There was a lot of repetition in those submissions. It's really worth mentioning that. 
a lot of them were like, you know, if you're going to sign a petition and you've got the letter and you just sign your name at the end of it, a lot of it was that. I would dare say the vast majority was, was that type of submission. Um, a lot of them were very personal letters, there was a lot of redacting had to be done. Um, a lot of them were from advocacy groups, uh, you know, lobby groups, interest groups. So, so you know, the, the, the submissions were really, really important actually because it was, it was, at that point we'd had all of the experts and then all of the submissions were given to us and then we were at that critical point we were trying to decide, well, how are we going to move forward here? What do we need to do next? And this was a real turning point in our citizen assembly, for the, in particular for the first topic, which was the Eighth Amendment, which was the abortion law. Um, and what we realised we needed to hear from, having read these submissions, was we needed to hear from people who had been affected by the existing constitutional Eighth Amendment on abortion. And that was when we had the subsequent weekend, we heard stories from men, women, affected by the Eighth Amendment. And that was a big changing weekend. And that was really, really important. So you can't underestimate the importance of those submissions, you know, because they are heard and they are read and they were all on the website. Much and all that they were working around the clock. The Secretariat worked around the clock to get all that stuff up on the website because we had a very, very short time frame, um, a deadline. So, so yeah, so, so the submissions really do count and it's a very good way for a broader reach of the population, of citizens, to have a say and not to feel like I'm just sitting at home here being fed information. You can reach out and you can participate in it and it is read and it does have an effect. Great. Let's have another question from the floor. Um, the lady right at the back with the yellow and blue top. How did you expect cross section of the handle and the work? Okay. So that was a question about reading age and how we can, you know, how we can make it um, inclusive if there is a large volume of material. Can I just say, one of the really important challenges for the designers, and, and again, some of them are in the room, is to think through how you offer, you know, it cannot all be reliant on people having to speak or having to read. There have to be formats and facilitation techniques that allow different styles of learning and engaging with the evidence. In the processes that we have organized at a smaller scale in Scotland, uh, we often try to provide different channels, and sometimes it might be infographics or videos or documentaries or podcasts. Um, in one of our projects, we made the experts record the videos rather than provide the evidence through written word. So you need to accommodate a range of styles of learning so that it's not dependent just on the spoken word. And that's also very important to accommodate all sorts of uh, learning needs and learning styles. And in the same way that the, the forms of contribution to the conversations cannot rely just on speaking. There have to be formats that allow people to prioritize and intervene in ways that don't depend on feeling super confident to make a super articulate point. So all of this is, the, is, is a design matter and a challenge for the facilitators, but we have a lot of evidence of the kind of things that work. I don't know. Louise wants to repeat her example she told me earlier about the truck driver, which oh, is an yeah. interesting example, I think. Yeah, I, I suppose through the process of being in the Citizen Assembly, you understand and you see and you learn weekend on weekend, everybody's different style of understanding, style of questioning, style of speaking, style of participating. And I was saying to the guys earlier that there was uh, one guy, Dave, if you're watching Dave, hi. <laughs> and uh, Dave, this truck driver, and he would stand up to ask his question. And I got to the point where the first couple of weekends Dave would stand up to ask the question and I got to the third weekend we'd go, oh God, <laughs> there goes Dave, right, Bed, down, we could be here for a while now. And Dave would start talking and he'd start talking and he'd keep going and he'd go and he'd go and he'd go and he could be three, maybe four minutes asking his question. 
He would only get to the point at the end of his question where he knew what the question was. <laughs> and that was his style. He didn't know what he was asking when he stood up. He just knew something wasn't right and he needed to, an answer to something. He wasn't sure what the question was. So what I'm saying is, like, that was included. And it came to the point where we had the last Q&A and Dave didn't stand up. We were like, where were you? We missed your question. We were waiting for your last question. He's like, oh, didn't have one. <laughs> we were all very disappointed. So I'm just saying that each person is given the space to come to their understanding and their learning in their own way. And not everything is writing. There's some, there's some writing, there's some listening, and there's note takers at the table. So for people who don't want to have to write everything down, everybody's voice that's, is, that's asked for. And if you're not talking, you'll be asked. Your facilitator will say, what do you think about that? And have you anything to add to this? So everybody is given time, and it's all written down. And that's all shaping what's happening in the background as well. Uh, I wanted to say, uh, if everybody can hear me, I wanted to say thank you to the ERS and to the university for hosting this because I think we all leave tonight much better informed and, and thanks to you guys as well. But I think we can see that this format is not the ideal format for having a conversation. Um, I think this is an exciting time for Scotland. I think it's a, a courageous decision that's been made. But, but it's not new, uh, and Joanna probably knows this better than anyone. Juries have been doing this for hundreds of years. Mm. Bringing guys off the street from all levels of society, presenting the facts and information, and make a decision at the end of it. So I, I, I really value some of the scepticism that's been echoed and, and embraced, David. Thank you for that. Louise, my question is, how much effort was made to find the consensus at the end of that effort before the report was written and agreed? How do we come to that end of, because I've, I've done some of this and I think you need to make sure that every voice is heard and that you're presenting the consensus and because if other people have participated, given their valuable time and feel disenfranchised, how do you, the question was asked about facilitation, how did you ensure or how did the process, David, ensure that the consensus was achieved that suited the majority of the people? Ours came down to voting, essentially. Um, you know, at the end of our process, you know, we had multiple, multiple ballot papers, you know, for example, ballot paper one, do you think we should leave the Eighth Amendment in the Constitution as it is, or do you think it should be changed? One or two. Next, based on the vote count for that, next paper, okay, right, we said we want to change it. What do you want to change that to? A, B, C, D, E, F, this, this, is. Okay, based on that now, and then we got started getting into nitty gritty because we knew change was required. So this is where all of our deliberations and all the note taken from our deliberations fed into what the questions were that we were being asked. Do you think it would be okay in this circumstance up to that amount of time? Yes. This circumstance, that amount of time? No. This circumstance, that. And all of the different circumstances, all the different time frames, all the different scenarios, medical, ethical, legal, all of that was taken into account through those ballot papers and that was what we finally, that was our final vote. And then ultimately, we were giving uh, a mandate to the, I suppose we voted that the Eighth Amendment should come out of the Constitution entirely and that it should be replaced with uh, an amendment stating that we gave rights to the government, sorry, to, to Parliament, to legislate for abortion in Ireland. And their legislation basically, I think the, the outline of the legislation was, was the, uh, the recommendations that we had made based on our deliberations. Yeah. Another question for us. Um, okay, the lady in this room. Uh, thank you very much. I don't think I have a direct question. I would like to make an observation. And the observation for me is that after 2014, Scotland <coughs> is hungry for change. Scotland is hungry for involvement that produces change and we should trust we should trust the people of Scotland. I don't believe that we should accept a media perspective that if political parties boycott it, it's not worthwhile. I don't believe we should accept that perhaps reading standards are low. What we have to accept is that people in Scotland are looking for change. 
And we have to enable that change to happen. And one of the ways is assemblies, gatherings, call it what you will, but at the moment it's being called citizens' assembly. We've been doing that for years. The women have been doing it. The young people do it in schools. Older people do it in church groupings, wherever. And who's to say that assembly won't work? Mm -hmm. I'll take another question. This says we're in the room, teacher. Yeah, just one of what we really said. But again, now the angle is looking for change. You know, they don't have an assembly. You know, they're a different one. They don't have it. So, again, there's some of us that are. Why do you think you're just about to say if I don't want another goal, you know, to be you then off their goals? We're not here, yeah. I'm going to talk about the Scottish Citizens Assembly today. Yeah, Thanks a lot, Dave. The President's government will agree to a citizen assembly <laughs> there. Um, the gentleman in the red t-shirt. Okay, my question is uh, for participation. How do you get the proof on the uh, members as you know the reflective like whether well, it's going to be any equality monitoring or any process like that? But you can see at the moment in there's no any process, yeah, we don't know in Scotland how many uh, councillors who are there from the ground or, or any institution. That, that's my one question. The third question is the outcome of the assembly is going to be legal basis or or you know, towards the initiative. Anyone here from talk about either policy or legal? Sorry, so the first question was about equality monitoring. Yeah, well, there's going to be equality monitoring of all the members. Uh, so we members. Find out who, uh, you know, right, that's lovely. Should we talk, just briefly cover the yeah, uh, selection I, again? I mean, as, I, as I said earlier, it will be selected on the basis of gender, uh, socioeconomic class, ethnicity, etc. And it will be monitored. Uh, and one I mentioned, forgot to mention that, I almost forgot to mention again, geographical uh, location as well. That will be published. Uh, so people will know the makeup of the assembly. Uh, and I think, again, I don't want to repeat what people said in earlier discussions, but if Leslie doesn't mind, I'll just make a point that Leslie made earlier. When we have a picture of the assembly, if it doesn't look like a genuine cross section of Scottish society, it will not work. So there has to be Asian faces in it, there has to be black faces in it. There has to be uh, young people, there has to be older people, there has to be disabled. It has to look like Scotland or it will not have any credibility. And that is our aim to make sure and when we select this uh, group of people. And the second point? The legal, the legal basis of the outcome. The legal status of the outcome. Similar to the question before about how, how, it's, it's, how it goes it, it has no ability formally to deliver its outcome other than moral persuasion and the credibility that the Assembly itself develops during its process. And we've heard from the Irish experience where the Assembly worked and where it did a good job, the politicians listened, and perhaps even more importantly, the general public uh, listened. But you cannot, you know, I'm, I'm afraid I can't sit here hand in heart at the moment and say that whatever the assembly comes up with, it will be deliverable. That's not how they work, unfortunately. Thank you. More questions. Um, there's a lady at the back there. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering how the process is perfect. So what are the weaknesses, downsides, versus incentives? My question was about weaknesses and downsides. I don't know if Oliver or David would like to um, experience. I mean, what I always say whenever uh, I have to give talks about this, um, we're still at, this is still quite an early thing. You know, Ireland is one of the first countries in the world to try out a citizens' assembly to discuss big questions. There are only a few handful of cases before then. So Scotland is still very much at the vanguard. So we're still learning, uh, and we're going to learn from, you know, experience. But I think one of the ways to answer your question perhaps is you've got to think very hard about the, the question that the Citizens' Assembly has been asked to consider. And I, I always borrow this example from a Canadian friend of mine who says you wouldn't want to fly an aeroplane designed by Citizens' Assembly. <laughs> right? So clearly you've got to think, it goes back to the earlier, earlier question about values. 
You, you, you ideally want a citizens' assembly to be talking about something around which there are underlying values and underlying differences. And you get to the nub of the project that way. I'm, I'm glad that David used the, the airplane analogy because I use it as well with my students, but in a different way. Um, and it's okay, we cannot fly the plane by assembly. But, um, so we want expertise, right? In the same way that we want expertise when we have heart surgery or, you know. Um, but we do want to um, be able to instruct the pilot where we're going, right? So that should be a democratic decision. Then fly the, the technical side of the plane the way you will and you have to. Um, there are many weaknesses. Many of them have come up in the conversation today. They have a lot to do with design choices, with choices in how the whole process is laid out, how it is built, and all the challenges that David and others face in constructing a space where this is going give to be given a chance. So there are challenges in recruitment, challenges in facilitation. All those things are not easy, and this is why it's important that we monitor and do research on it. Um, perhaps the biggest, the biggest critique that people used to make of these kind of bodies is that, um, that they, they were not connected, usually in the past, especially the smaller ones, not clearly connected to the system, so that they will have some kind of influence or impact. And we are hoping that that's going to be different here in the way uh, that it was in Ireland. Um, My understanding from the reading is that there are three questions that are being posed. Um, is it the same group of 100 people in the assemblies that will take the, the conversations across all three? Is there an opportunity uh, then beyond that to have a, uh, maybe a, an extended or a different uh, group of uh, people in uh, further assemblies even to contemplate those same questions as well, so you get an even broader uh, input? Yeah, I, mean, I think when the First Minister made this announcement, she set out these three broad questions that David mentioned earlier. What kind of country are we seeking to build? How best can we overcome the challenges that we face, including those that arise from Brexit? And what further work should be carried out to give people the detail they need to make informed choices about the future? Now, I thought it was interesting when David said at the beginning that Ireland's Citizen Assembly, the Constitutional Convention, then the Citizens' Assembly got off the ground at a time when Ireland was in a state of, of a crisis of democracy following upon the financial crash. Thank the Lord with no financial crash yet. But in Scotland does face a crisis of, crisis of democracy at the moment because of Brexit, the country is facing being taken out of the European Union against its will, by that I mean Scotland. And there's also the ongoing debate about independence. So I, I speculate that what the First Minister was doing there was setting out the context of the Citizens' Assembly. As David has said, the questions are going to require refinement. I would like to think that this Citizens' Assembly that takes place this autumn <coughs> will be the first of a series of Citizens' Assemblies. Now, the one that Louise was involved in in Ireland, the abortion one, that took place, I think, over six months roughly in Ireland. Yes, the, the abortion topic was over five weekends. But we, we, we've met over a total of 18 months and we had four other, five, four other topics. Yeah. So you did, yeah. you did the climate change, did, uh, and had aging population, population challenges. climate change, challenges and opportunities of an aging population, mm -hmm. manner in which referenda are held, and fixed should, term should we have fixed term parliaments. And, and so I think there's every possibility that, we're, that we could be entering into a series of citizens' assemblies as they did in Ireland. Now, I think in Ireland I'm right in saying that they, they had the same cohort of people, although some people came and went over that entire period. Yeah. I'd rather wonder whether it would be better to have different cohorts if we're going to have several. Because apart from anything else, I think Louise, when we were chatting earlier, you said people got a bit exhausted by Yeah, the by the end of the 18 months, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to add something quickly on the, on the boycott. Remember what we're looking for here is a hundred citizens representative of Scottish society taking into account age, taking into account ethnicity, taking into account other protected <coughs> characteristics. Those of us who are politically aligned and knock doors will tell you most people are not adherent to one political party. I wouldn't be sitting here if they were because I represent a seat where the SNP were in fourth place for a very long time when we went from fourth place to first place in, in 2015. My dad sitting at home, who's a long-standing member of the SNP in his 80s, is still in a state of shock 
that his daughter is an SNP MP for an Edinburgh constituency. So <laughs> movements happen equally. I lost a big chunk of my majority at the last election because some people went off and voted for other parties. So people move. And if, if this boycott goes ahead, and I, I really have a lot of positive feeling that it won't, <clears throat> it's not the same as boycotting an election or a referendum because it will not be difficult to find 100 citizens who represent a cross-section of Scotland. I think one thing that we haven't mentioned so far is the citizens will receive, in addition to reimbursement of their expenses, an honorarium um, in recognition of their services, which I believe they didn't get in Ireland, and I think people will say that's one mistake that the Irish system, system made. People who have caring duties will have the expenses of, those, of the of their services as a carer uh, being uh, replicated or respite care while they're not there. So I don't think a boycott will destroy the Assembly at all, but I really am travelling hopefully that it won't happen. that the location of the Citizens' Assembly, where they held, might be considered in terms of both the, the legitimacy and the visibility and the sense of ownership in the wider Scotland. How about Stirling? <laughs> <laughs> Which happens to be where Wanda lives. <laughs> Not against Scotland. The problem, the, the problem is, and I'm not involved in picking the location, but the problem has been identifying a suitable location that you can hold not just 100 people, but all the paraphernalia that will go around the assembly, uh, and do it for five weekends a year, and there's no wedding on the Saturday or, or whatever, uh, and it's not been easy, and so not finally decided, but you've probably heard in the media, it's likely that one, the opening one will be in Edinburgh and the other five will be on the west coast. Uh, and, but it's been picked to ensure that maximum accessibility and anybody travelling a distance will be supported in terms of the expenses and so on. But we did, uh, I think, sorry to say, I think we probably now have finally built this out, but we did think about having it in six different places, but the logistics just became impossible and actually this is very central belt now for me to say this, but once you move from the central belt, it becomes very, it becomes more difficult for a lot of people to get there, not just, not just the people from the central belt, but if you move to the borders, it becomes a nightmare for the people from the highlands and so on, so I'm afraid I think it's going to be Edinburgh 1 and West Coast 5. Another question. The gentleman in the blue top. MSPs, MPs, members of the Lords, MEPs are all debarred from being members of it. I'm obvious. Not overtly if they shot the, the random sample, but there would be there would be strict rules about how anybody can approach a member of the assembly and it would be you know if if, if if lobbyists approach assembly members directly, assembly members will be asked to report no, that, that fact. Well, not, they, they won't be allowed in as a lobbyist, but if they come up randomly as a cross-section of society, I don't think you can trade to one section. You, you like saying you can't have a doctor, you can't have an engineer. Um, no, again, again, political parties, I mean, again, it would be random. And look, we're probably going to get a position... No, no, I know, I know, I know but it's a, serious, it's a serious point, because... You know, a couple of assemblies in, somebody in the press is going to discover that somebody's been a member of the Conservative Party for 30 years, or the SNP for 20 years, and try and make a fuss about this. But if you're having a random section of the population, that is going to happen. Uh, and it wouldn't be random if that sort of thing didn't happen. So we're, we're prepared for this, but you know, I know you made the point jokingly, but it is a serious point that being a member of a party will not debar you from taking part. Point that 
David made, I, I really admire the aspiration that these are open and transparent and that observers can attend and potentially media as well. But we do live in a very febrile environment at the moment, so how are Assembly members supported through that? Um, <coughs> might they feel constrained about asking a question or making a point in case it got picked up in the media or worse, social media? Uh, and if it is, how are they supported? It's a very good question. And one of the things I've been impressed by, and Louise can say more about the Irish experience, but one of the it's nothing to do with me, but in being briefed and taking on this role is how detailed the Secretariat Company the Civil Service have actually taken on the, the duty of care and they, they have actually thought about this in great detail how people can be protected and, and enhanced through this, this experience. One of the debates we're having, and again it goes debate between transparency and this duty of care, is should we name everybody who's on the assembly, or should we simply say, you know, here, here is demographic, demographic, this is where people are from, this is their background, but not actually name them. Uh, we haven't decided on that yet. I mean, we know there's, there's arguments on both sides. There will be people who would like to appear in the media. There'll be people who don't want to be known to be members of the assembly, or don't want people to see them uh, discussing, so we'll make sure that if it's filmed, People who don't want to be identified have their backs to the cameras and uh, such like things. So this is, I mean, it's a really good question. It's a really important question. And I'm pleased to say nothing to do with me, but it's been taken very, very, very seriously. And I don't know if Louise could maybe say something from our own experience. Yeah, so in our one, we had um, independent observers and media and, and uh, at the back of the room. And you'd be surprised, actually, we didn't really pass much remarks of them. Um, when we went into roundtable discussions, they were asked to leave. The, the event was, uh, each weekend was live streamed, all the plenary sessions, all the presentations were all live streamed, so that was all available on the website live. Um, but the roundtable discussions, the cameras were switched off and the guys went out. The Q&A, that was filmed and that was, um, had the media and observers back in. So you had the choice in the Q&A you could stand up and ask a question yourself or you could ask the facilitator to ask it on your behalf and you know at each table it was very obvious where the cameras were the cameras were set up and they didn't move around so people just sat themselves according to what they were comfortable with and if they didn't want to ask a question or didn't want anything and also nobody knew who we were even though they knew there was the list of names and the list of counties <coughs> they wouldn't have known well that's Louise Caldwell there so they wouldn't have been able to attribute something I said to my name, even if they had the list of my name. So there was no way for, for, that, for that to happen, I don't think. And it certainly didn't happen. Yeah. So. If I just add a quick thing, because you talk about the febrile nature, you, you know, when they were discussing abortion, uh, there was a fair deal of uh, worry about how that was going to unfold. So every single weekend when the Citizens' Assembly was meeting, there were people outside the gates of the hotel where they met with huge pictures of fetuses. Uh, you know, there, there was one individual who was in attendance all the time protesting at the gates and when they voted in the, on the fifth weekend they had to have the police on hand just in case, they weren't needed but that was the level of tension that occasionally would arise so it's, it's not that unique uh, the situation that you could be facing here but, but it's worth saying that nothing bad ever happened. No. None of us were ever approached, nobody picketed outside my house no one attacked me on social media, nobody said anything and they knew who I was, and they knew what county I was from. So, you know, there was other people who had more unique names than I that would easily have been findable online, but it, it didn't happen. And if a lobby group, the lobby groups were told very clearly at the outset, if you approach any of the members directly, you'll be excluded from any involvement in the process. So they were, they were told that very clearly, and that was... And to my knowledge, I don't, that, that hasn't happened, that didn't happen at all. Yeah. You know, which was, I think it's a surprise for everybody. Yeah. We've got time for one last question, so... Yes, I, I was just wondering if there had been s uh, provisional dates established for the, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, I mean, is it three planned or five? I mean, uh, how many are planned and what are the provisional dates, basically? Okay. That's, thank you. That's an easy one to think yeah. <laughs> um, The plan is hopefully to hold the first one in September or October and then one a month thereafter for five months, excluding December. So we'll probably run to March next year. Okay, okay thank you.
Thank you. That brings us to the end of this evening's panel. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your brilliant questions. Oliver's desperate to say something, yeah. so before we wrap up. <laughs> but first, I want to apologize for not having microphones, which is not a good look for the university. But I, I want to just, just add a thought here, because we haven't mentioned the evidence. We have evidence from these experiments all over the world, and we know that when the right conditions are in place, Citizens have the capacity to learn and deliberate on complex issues and come to inform conclusions. So that's, that's what we know. Uh, but what's at stake here is, is it goes beyond that. Because it's not even about the issue that we are going to end up and the specific task. What's at stake is whether we are going to find a new institution that could help us to improve parliamentary democracy. So what's at stake is our capacity to then deal with a number of other crises on criminal justice, on drugs, on climate change. So it's not just about whatever task we do now. It's about testing this process so that we develop a new institution to work with our existing institutions and project us into that new form of democracy. Any final comments to make? No? Well, thank you so much for coming and thanks again to our panelists.